In this video, I talk with Frank David, the CEO of Pharmagellan, about a framework for analyzing biotech clinical trials and estimating the probability of success of a given trial. So Frank actually recently wrote a book on this topic, Analyzing Biotech Clinical Trials. I definitely recommend that folks check it out. And uh, he also wrote another book that might be of interest to subscribers to this channel on uh, biotech forecasting and financial analysis. Um, but for this video, uh, Frank has some slides he's gonna walk through on his framework for analyzing clinical trial data. And uh, this framework is derived from his experience as CEO of Pharmagellan, a consulting firm that helps biopharma companies realize the value from their pipeline. And also his previous experience as a consultant at Learing Partners, one of the top biotech consulting firms, and his experience prior to that in other roles, including as a um, director of strategy in AstraZeneca's uh, Innovative Oncology Medicines Unit. So I uh, hope you enjoy the video. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah. And today we're going to be focusing specifically on a topic that is uh, of interest to a lot of people who are learning about biotech investing. And uh, that is assessing clinical trial risk. And specifically, a lot of people ask about how do you estimate the probability that a clinical trial is going to succeed? And that's a very challenging task, part art, part science, and we're going to be diving into that today. Um, so any you know quick intro remarks about that topic before we dive in, Frank? No, I mean, I, I think I would just reiterate that this is a tough area and the it is as you said, equal parts art and science, and maybe even 70% art and 30% science. Um, and you know, I think we'll get into a lot of the qualitative pieces, which I think will help people figure out for themselves how to set their own thermostat in terms of the quantitative part. Right, and then just to jump in, I'll go ahead and walk through a few reasons why it's important to do this, just to set the stage, and then we'll hand it over to you, Frank, to do the, the rest of the presentation. Um, so just quickly, why is it important to estimate the probability of success? Uh, so one, you know, if you're an investor, you'll know these binary events happen and estimating the probability of success helps you have better odds of getting more of those calls right. It helps investors value companies and make investment decisions. It also helps companies design clinical trials. Uh, so you need to know the probability of a different, a study with a different design succeeding or failing so you can make the right decisions to accomplish whatever your goals are uh, in terms of your own company's clinical development. And then it also helps companies with their internal pipeline prioritization. Uh, so deciding between allocating resources with one program or another, uh, knowing what the probability of success is, is a critical input to, to doing those calculations and analyses. So jumping into just the sort of a quick uh, overview of how the probability of success ties into your valuation. So we've done videos on this before, but and it's essentially, if you're looking at a, a clinical trial readout, a data readout, the value of the company before the data is essentially equal to the value if the study succeeds times the probability that it succeeds. And you calculate this first component, the value if the study succeeds, you know, using comps or DCF methods. Uh, you know, you calculate the total number of potential patients to get the drug, do research to see you know, what kind of market share the product would have vis-a-vis -vis the competitors and standard of care, look at pricing, uh, costs and expenses. And those are all things you do when you're analyzing any uh, company uh, in biopharma. And a lot of these techniques can be used in other industries as well. But the probability of success calculations are much more uh, nuanced and a little bit trickier. Yeah, I would just add to that, um, that in for the public markets, one of the big challenges is also figuring out how much of the POS is baked into the current valuation. Um, you know, if you're an investor and basically that the price already assumes success, that's a very different situation than if it's truly a risk adjusted value and that there's some sort of risk number associated with this upcoming catalyst. Yeah. And that leads into this point as well. So this is an example of uh, a recent binary readout. This one happened to go negative where this company lost 90% of its value on a phase three result that was, was negative. And you know, when there's risk in a trial, you're always going to have big movements up and down just because you don't know what the, the outcome is going to be in advance. But if a lot of if success is baked in to the uh, investors' expectations, you'll see a much bigger drop. So, you know, whether that's the case in this example, you need to do more research to, to make that conclusion. But um, understanding what the market is pricing in, yeah, that's sometimes maybe easier than coming up with your own specific number for probability of success. Um, sometimes it's not, but it, it's definitely, definitely a really important point. 
That's right. I mean, there's a, a you know another way to do this, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but you know to kind of start with what the market says the value is and work your way backward into what is the implied probability of success and do you agree with that or not? In some cases, is at least as important and certainly as instructive as trying to do it bottoms up and come up with your own number and then say, okay, does my number agree or not agree with what the market says? Um, you know, it can be a lot more. It, it can be a lot more feasible sometimes to kind of start with the end um, and and get a sense of really what does the market does the market say that this has a seventy percent probability of success or a thirty percent probability of success? And then where do I stand relative to that? Sometimes is an easier question to answer. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And we'll get into more of that uh, later, but that's a, that's a really good point. And then another example for why, if you, in addition to being an investor, you could also use probability of success, or you would also use probability of success for planning your own clinical study design. So there's a million reasons why you would need to do this and how different aspects of trial design play into the ultimate probability of success for the study. But as a super simple example here, um, say you're designing a pivotal study for a lung cancer drug. And you're looking at a couple of different patient populations. You're looking at one, you know, very small, genetically defined patient population that say it represents 5% of the total uh, addressable population. And then you're also considering a more heterogeneous population. And the trade-off there is that the genetically defined uh, subgroup, you may have higher confidence that the drug's going to work based on your knowledge of the biology. But then if you do it in a, a phase three study and you just study a genetically defined population, your market size will be smaller. So there's a really big trade-off here. And in many cases, you're sort of betting the company on this and it's impossible to make an informed decision if you don't actually have a sense of what the probability of success of each trial is going to be. And then the, the last example here, and there are others, but the last one that I'll, I'll go through is, is prioritizing indications. So if you're an earlier stage company, you know, let's say you have a, a couple of preclinical um, candidates and you have some good data in you know, some animal models, um, and you're trying to understand what you do your initial you know, human proof of concept study in. And you've done your market research, so you know the epidemiology, the unmet need, you know, the competitive landscape. You have a sense of you know, how much revenue you could make in each of these indications, um, and you have enough capital only to fund one. Uh, so you have a lot of information there, but you really can't make any informed decisions unless you have a sense of what the risk reward is. Uh, and to get the risk part, you need to know the, the probability of success. Yeah, and I would just add here that if you're in a small biotech, obviously this is layered on to an overall question of what your aspirations are in terms of business development, financing, et cetera. Um, you know, you might come to a different conclusion if your goal is um, raising money from the public market or private markets versus uh, enabling a business development discussion with a large pharma company um, versus neither, right? Versus just continuing to truck along and, and do your thing. Um, you know, if you're particularly well-funded and you actually are not, you, you know, you don't in intend for this necessarily to have to be a catalyst for future fundraising. Um, and, you know, so those all end up in addition to the probability of success, you know, there's also sort of a larger strategic question. I was thinking on your prior slide, you know, really all of these questions just boil down to the fact the four levers that you have are essentially cost, time, risk, and reward, right? For any for any clinical program. And they all interact with each other. So, but there's many different ways to solve that for for unknown problem. Um, and there's no, there's no one single right answer there. Yep. Yep. And I remember I skimmed through your book as well before the call. I know you talk about at the beginning, the goals for doing a clinical study and how, if you don't know the goals of a clinical study, then a lot of this isn't, isn't quite going to have the impact that the, that it could otherwise and, and how that's really important. Absolutely right. And I would say on this particular example with the phase three, you know, you gave it as a phase three study for a lung cancer drug. I'd say a particularly interesting variant on that is when you're talking about what to do in phase two, because that's where there end up being really interesting questions about, do you run a very broad phase two where you might give up the chance of seeing a signal as a top line, but then maybe you'll gain the ability to do some post-hoc uh, uh, analysis, which could find something and then how valuable is that going to be and how valuable will that be perceived versus doing a much narrower proof of concept study really exquisitely designed to test the biology and the pharmacology of what you're trying to do, but may not fully unlock uh, the, uh, the entire opportunity. Um, and again, that gets back to this question of what is your goal here? Is your goal to 
convince Pfizer that your drug does what it says it's going to do? Or is your drug, is your goal to convince investors that you could attack all of non-small cell lung cancer? Or is it something different from those things? Um, yeah, so that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, when I was thinking about sort of what the framework is for thinking about clinical trials, really thinking about the goals of the study ends up being a piece that I think a lot of us do intuitively, but we don't necessarily articulate. And I've always found for myself, it's worth, it's worth sitting down and really trying to articulate what do you think the point of the study is? Yeah. And I'm sure that that's something you do all the time with your, your consulting clients is, is bring the discussion to that, that level and then get into the, the analytics behind that as well. Absolutely. I mean, we're having, you know, again, not to jump ahead too much, but you know, when you were talking about the portfolio discussion on the next slide, we have a client right now where that in fact is a big part of the discussion is trying to understand um, for each asset um, really help help them decide what is their goal? Are, is their goal to actually take this all the way or is their goal to make enough data that they can partner? And those have totally different implications in terms of how much resources you wanna spend, how much time you wanna spend and what type of work you would do and how you would design it. Um, and you know that's something where this is this is a, a less experienced team that we're working with. So I'm not sure that they have previously force themselves to that level of, you know, what I would call forced choice. You know, you can't say, oh, well, it depends on how the data, no, you have to actually put your, put your shit down on one or the other of those, uh, of those sides. Yeah. You, you can't sort of pivot and iterate once you've put your entire series That's A around right. towards one study. Yeah. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. And I know this is a, a huge topic and also obviously very dependent on the specifics of the company. So um, I'll definitely leave your contact in the description for the YouTube. So people can reach out if they want to have uh, deeper conversations. Um, but now I'll just uh, hand it over to you to go through the topic of today's discussion, which is how to analyze the probability of success for clinical studies. Great. Um, well, first of all, I'll just start with some disclosures. Uh, I'm a consultant. Uh, you should assume that I'm conflicted with any company that I mention, regardless of whether I am or not. Um, although nobody else participated in this, uh, in this presentation, and I do have an additional specific disclosure with regard to Santa Fe. Okay, so let's dive into it. Um, so one of the things I've really been thinking about recently in the wake of having written this book is really uh, a framework for methodically evaluating clinical trial risk. Um, so let's let's go through a couple of these slides and see. The, you know, this is this is an example which we'll come back to in the in the case study, but. Um, if you just look at the indication and phase, and we'll come back to this a little bit later, you can derive generic, or you can find in the literature, generic numbers for what's the probability of success of a phase three program in ischemic stroke, um, and you'll get some number, but you, that number hides a lot of variability. So program one here is, if not a me too, then certainly a, a me also, or a me very similar, basically following on on a well-established uh, therapeutic modality. TPA is already used in the clinic. So coming in with a next generation TPA, probably a pretty safe bet. Um, and in, that, in this case, again, I've taken an extreme example where they've already done a phase two that essentially has the same output as the planned phase three. Um, and really they're just running a phase three to get bigger numbers and get additional data and um, you know, get more safety information and also just get more ancillary information on secondary endpoints, et cetera. And then you would have almost like a homeopathy type of experiment on the other side. And although it's written to be absurd, you know, honestly, we see these things, right? I mean, I think, I think there's a lot, there are examples of, uh, of projects that go into phase three with very scant data on the mechanism of the drug, um, of what the drug actually is, what its mechanism is, and very scant clinical data as well. Um, so you know, these clearly have different probabilities of success and you know, most programs lie in between these. And I think the challenge is really how do you in a structured way start to think about where to, where to set the thermostat and where to, um, where to assign a POS number to these different programs. So that's one issue. The other, as we talked about on the previous slide, is that uh, not all, even if you're at the same stage, at the same phase of development, the uh, quantity and quality of, of preceding clinical data can be highly variable. Um, the third is more of a sponsor piece. You know, is the, um, is the, 
program different, does it have a different probability of success in one company's hands than in the current company's hands than it would in somebody else's hands? Um, and then the fourth has to do with trial design. And again, we'll talk more about trial design. Um, and that's where I spent a lot of the time in the book, obviously. But, you know, I think it's important to realize that the trial design is really just one piece of the overall probability of success for a program. So if we go to the next slide, um, you know, so this is, this is a work in progress for me, but, um, you know, really I've been working with some clients both on the investor side and on the, um, on the pharma side to really try to be a little bit more methodical about how we think about clinical trial risk, whether it's for internal programs or whether it's for business development or whether it's for financial investment. And really trying to make sure that we have categories that don't contaminate each other. So, you know, the classic consulting uh, term of art for this would be MISI, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. So the idea is let's describe all the different things that go into clinical trial risk um, and make sure that we're not double counting and we're not missing anything. Um, so again, on the first, the first thing here is what I'm calling data-driven risk, which is really the data, what is known in terms of the data for this particular asset. Next is the inherent scientific risk. That's really the knowledge of the disease and the MOA. It's also understanding a patient selection. How well do we understand what patients we should be including or ex including or excluding from the study? The third are, is this somewhat of a catch-all, but this category of sponsor dependent risk, which really has to do with expertise, experience, and capabilities across a whole range of functions, which might make you think that the trial is more or less likely to succeed. And then the fourth, again, is trial design risk, uh, which is somewhat self-explanatory. I think it's important to note a couple of things here. Um, one is just to reiterate, data-driven risk and inherent scientific risk are mutually exclusive by which I mean that you can have a lot of data in a very risky area. So, you know, let's take a, um, an area like Alzheimer's, for example. There are a lot of preclinical models that people use. I think the general sense of the field is that they stink. Um, they're just not predictive at all, um, but you can make a ton of data. So that has that that's high on preclinical data, but also high on inherent scientific risk. And meanwhile, you could have something like the example I gave before of the next generation thrombolytic in ischemic stroke. And you might not actually feel that you need a ton of data to move forward on something like that and feel like it's relatively de-risked if you feel like it fits very cleanly in the MOA and the pathways and the biology and the patient selection that's already been well established in that clinical area. So then the yeah. inherent scientific risk, just so, so I understand is that's sort of the risk you would attribute to a clinical trial if you didn't really know what the data for the target drug was. So, and then the, the data-driven risk is once you layer on the data that's been generated by your target compound, then that that's additive to the sort of background risk of the underlying indication and in pathway. Is that fair? Yeah, that's right. I would say inherent scientific risk is, you know, inherent is the operat or operative word there, right? It's inherent to the area and, div and divorced from any consideration of this particular asset's data. Um, so it's really just looking at the mechanism um, how well do you understand the proposed mechanism of this drug? How well is it understood whether that proposed mechanism, um, how that proposed mechanism fits into the disease? Whereas the data-driven risk is really the strength of evidence that, um, that this, it's, it's really data-driven efficacy risk in many ways, although obviously there's their safety as part of that too, but it's how well do you, how good is the evidence base basically for this particular asset? Um, okay. So you would have two, you know, if I have two Alzheimer's uh, drugs that are both targeting tau, they both would have the same level of inherent scientific risk, but then they might have different levels of data-driven risk because they've done different experiments uh, on those particular assets. Got it. Okay. Makes sense. You know, the only thing I was just going to add is you know, there are obviously a lot of other pieces of risk, and we might come back and talk about those later, that would feed into a DCF model. You know, you think about regulatory risk, you think about market access, you know, pricing and market access risk. Um, you know, those are all very important. I think most people, myself included, would try to keep those things cleanly separated when building a DCF. So try not to contaminate the uh, the regulatory piece 
with the with the trial piece, for example, right? You can have a trial where the odds of success are very, very high. However, it might not be designed optimally to get regulatory approval. That's a regulatory risk. That's not a clinical development risk per se. Um, even though the reason, the underlying reason is around trial design, that could still be a very well-designed trial to minimize risk, even though it's not fit, necessarily fit for purpose in terms of getting an approval. Got it, makes sense. Good. Um, so I just wanted, <clears throat> I, I didn't want to go through each of these in exhaustive detail, but I just wanted to hit a couple of highlights of things that certainly I, I have found worth reiterating, again, both to investors and strategics uh, in this area. You know, one is uh, really looking at the strength of phase two data. You know, this is a very common situation. Um, and I think, you know, we very, we, collectively in the industry often refer to phase two data as proof of concept, but the word proof does a lot of work in that phrase. Um, and there's a lot of variability in terms of the strength of phase two data specifically um, in terms of its ability to de-risk phase three. I did cite down below, um, there's a great set of case studies from the FDA on uh, situations in which the phase two was nominally positive and then the phase three failed and really just trying to describe some of the reasons. Re highly recommended, super interesting group of cases. And then this, um, this Pocock and Stone paper uh, from New England Journal, I think it's called, uh, I think he, they wrote two papers. One is basically uh, the trial was positive, now what? And the other is the trial is negative, now what? So I think this one is the trial is positive, now what? And it's all the reasons to be maybe suspicious or less enthusiastic about positive data. Um, you know, I think some of these are well known and I don't think we need to spend a lot of time, but you know, the degree to which there's been multiple hypothesis testing going on and therefore, um, you know, just to the, the, abil the ability to make a, uh, a strong statistical claim is, is lessened. It's extremely common. Poorly predictive surrogate endpoints. I, you know, almost all surrogate, end surrogate endpoints are poorly predictive at some level. And this is another of those areas where it involves setting your own thermostat and also looking in context. Um, but clearly there are, within a given therapeutic area, there are often surrogate endpoints that are more or less, viewed as more or less uh, predictive. Um, Post hoc subset analyses, I think, you know, again, fits within multiple hypothesis testing, but is particularly worth calling out. Um, overall, small effect size, you know, I, I think it's a general heuristic in drug development that effect sizes rarely get bigger from phase two to phase three. They usually get smaller just as you as you get rid of noise and as you as you test more patients. So having an already borderline effect is certainly a red flag. Um, and then in general, just having a small sample side where you have what's called a fragile result, meaning if you just in a, in a, in the simple case, if you have a binary outcome from a trial and how many patients would have had to switch from the positive group to the negative group to have made the statistical significance go away um, or to have made the finding look less impressive. If you have a very small trial, you know, big diff the difference between you know, 70% positive, 30% negative versus 60-40 versus 50-50. I mean, this is small numbers of patients um, that could totally change how you feel about the study. And so overall, it's kind of a low confidence decision-making environment. Um, so, and again, the, the references are good to look at there. Uh, I, going back to intrinsic scientific risk, um, Again, I think somewhat obvious from what we've talked about before, but you know, there is a lot that you can imagine in your own mind. And again, for me, it's been very informative to think about disease areas that I work across and kind of put them in rank order in terms of intrinsic science, in terms, in terms of intrinsic scientific risk. I really ask myself if I had no bias, if I had no skin in the game at all, if I were just purely an external financial investor who was agnostic about disease area, how would I rank the riskiness of these different um, therapeutic areas? Um, it's, it's a, again, a very helpful exercise to go through just to kind of uh, check your own assumptions of, of how you think about POS. And obviously areas with high risk are just prone to false positive results in the, in the, uh, in the clinic. And so you, when you're looking at the spectrum of intrinsic scientific risk, I know that a lot of times you can just kind of look at the high level 
you know, therapeutic level rates of progression from one, one phase to another of clinical development. And that may get you a very, very you know, surface level piece of it. Um, but as you said earlier, even within that, there's so much variability. So you really need to go through all of these, right? To really, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a great point. I find that those data on, you know, progression rates through different um, phases of development by therapeutic area, which we'll talk about more a little bit later, um, I don't find them that helpful for really thinking hard and in a nuanced way about this particular question. You know, for me, I really want to go back and look at those individual studies, whether positive or negative, and understand what... Um, what kind of data did they have? How well was the biology understood at the time that that study was done? Um, how does that change depending on where we are now? What is the state of the art in terms of preclinical models and really how have they evolved and really what do experts think is the utility of the, of the commonly used preclinical models and are there emerging new preclinical models? Um, the drug MOA, you know, this is something where I think in the modern, in the in the 2020s is, is a little is turning into a little bit less of an issue, but certainly, you know, you don't have to go back very far to drugs with really uncertain mechanisms or really pleiotropic mechanisms. Think about the multi-kinase inhibitors, think about even, you know, VEGF, you know, the anti-angiogenesis drugs, where there was just profound lack of knowledge about how they actually worked. Um, you know, think about a lot of sort of more quote unquote, chemotherapeutic types of agents. Um, you know, always worth, again, maybe less of a concern if we're talking about like exquisitely molecularly targeted therapies. Um, but even there, I mean, I'll just give one quick example. Um, you know, in the uh, sort of the antibody, in antibody treatments, biologic treatments for cancer, um, you know, often there's some debate or discussion or there's a spectrum of possible answers about whether the antigen is purely just playing a homing mechanism. It's just purely to get you to the tumor and then you're going to deliver a payload. Or if there's some intrinsic biological activity that you're going to have by actually binding this cell surface molecule on the, on the surface of the cancer cells. Um, and there's actually, a, there can be a fair amount of uncertainty or a fair amount of uh, variability in terms of how much evidence there is there in terms of what the real MOA is of the, of the biologic in that case. And for so, a lot of drugs that are natural products or maybe you do some you know, phenotypic screening or just analyze some data and try to repurpose something. But if you're missing this core piece of information, that just adds layers more uncertainty. Absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, phenotypic screening was super hot. And I think from a scientific point of view, all, you know, obviously has been great. Um, but, you know, I think that there's a lot of discomfort, at least in the modern, in the modern era. I think it's really hard to get either strategic or financial investors over the hump of excitement over something where uh, it came out of a screen and we don't exactly understand how it works. Mm -hmm. And I think that this, that plays a reason for that is just this persistent overhang of intrinsic scientific risk, which by the way, you, you know, I think important to add here also that um, that risk doesn't go away as you advance through the clinic. Um, you know, I think there is this, this idea sometimes that positive clinical data kind of makes the other risks go away. And that's more, you know, clinical data trumps everything. Um, I'm not so sure that's true. I would say that if you don't know how the drug works, yeah, you've gotten some phase two data, but now you're still a riskier phase three program than a comparable study of something where you actually do understand how it works. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. And I think your whole decoupling of intrinsic scientific risk from data is, is really important just because, you know, there's only so many clinical studies to do and study results are so fragile in many ways. And you know, a clinical study is not our definitive read on what biology says and what nature says. It's just one study of right. something that we try to, to learn from. I think that's right. Good. And I think I made a one or two more. Right. So, you know, one thing, no, no, we can go on. So okay. on, so on the, uh, on phase three trial design, um, this is, it's not that we're only looking at phase three trials. Obviously this is this kind of rubric is applicable anywhere. Um, phase three is a place where in particular, I think it's a little bit easier to identify uh, red flags. Whereas as compared to phase two studies where 
there's just a wider tolerance for what you what a phase two could or should look like. Um, you know, in phase three, it's a little clearer what you're trying to do, getting back to that goals discussion that you were talking about previously. Um, you know, one of the one of the whole reasons I wrote the book um, was that I was angry about the phrase uh, underpowered, uh, which you see a lot in news articles about failed trials. And I realized that for myself, I had done all of this training and read all of these papers, and I still wasn't exactly sure how that math was done and how underpowered was it? And was it really underpowered or is it just a negative study? Um, so, you know, understanding that there's a relationship between the power and the size on the one hand, and what's the size of the effect that you're actually trying to detect um, is a particularly important thing. I mean, a phase three study, sure it has a size, but that size is driven by the minimum effect that it that it is uh, that it is enabled to see. That is the power, it's the power to detect an effect size of X or greater. So, um, so often what a, an underpowered study means that that bar has been set too high relative to what would be a clinically meaning result, meaningful result, by which I mean you're in a disease area where a 10% improvement in metric X would be clinically extremely important, but because you couldn't afford that big a study, you design a much smaller study and you can only detect a 30% or greater improvement in that particular parameter. So that's a real, that's an underpowered study. Mm -hmm. Um, or a potentially underpowered study. Again, maybe there's reason to believe that you can hit that higher bar, um, but I think it is uh, something where it, it's worth thinking closely about what the powering of the study is. And although it's somewhat hard to do that for a complex trial designs and also hard to do that with the limited amount of information that you get from clinicaltrials.gov, for example, um, we do present in the book a couple, for a couple of simple cases some ways that you can do essentially a back of the envelope power calculation um, for either a planned or a uh, or a completed trial to really understand the relationship between effect size and sample size. So that's one piece that 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 is pretty common. Endpoints are a particular problem. Um, you know, if you go back and read that NIH set of 22 case studies, changing endpoints between phase two and phase three is is a huge contributor to phase three study failure. Now, sometimes that's by design, um, you know, that you've used a surrogate endpoint on purpose and because you can get there faster, cheaper, et cetera. And now, you're, now you've decided it's worth investing in the longer and more expensive phase three study. That's all well and good, as long as you have high confidence that that surrogate actually is predictive. And I think there are many places where that surrogate is certainly plausible but the data supporting its predictive value are actually pretty meager. And, you know, particularly, I think what we're seeing in rare diseases in particular, where there's just not as much of a heritage of drug development, um, that's a very common situation where you have a phase three, phase two. It's certainly a very plausible clinic. Um, it's a plausible endpoint. It certainly it makes sense. And I could draw a pretty picture for a PhD program seminar about why these things, should, why that endpoint and the clinical and the uh, phase three regulatory endpoint should be related. But the amount of evidence supporting that is actually often pretty meager in these areas where there's not been very much development. And there are there a couple of pretty high profile recent phase three trial failures that exhibited that mode of failure where you know, you had a phase two that measured a surrogate endpoint and the data looked great. And then we went to phase three, you know, maybe the surrogate was like a co-primary endpoint, but you also had, you know, your pre-specified, you know, symptomatic or outcome-based endpoint. And in a lot of cases, you measure a bunch of, you know, clinical endpoints in addition to the surrogate endpoint in phase two, but your primary is the surrogate. So how do you think about looking at a phase three study when you have a phase two that has a surrogate and a bunch of sort of secondary endpoints that are clinical? Uh, how does that, how do you think about evaluating the risk of that? Yeah, I think it's it's a really complicated area. I think in general, I try to avoid being over enthusiastic, and to, you know, I don't. I think that just being realistic about how much risk is left in that phase three study um, in that scenario, I think, is super important. Doesn't mean that there. It doesn't mean that you tank it. Doesn't mean it has no odds of success. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, clearly, those data have some val that have some non-zero value. I think it's really just a question of how much value do you ascribe 
to those to those earlier data. And again, that's where it gets back to what you were saying at the beginning. It's more art. That's more art than science. Nobody can tell you that. Well, phase two data on you know this particular um, uh, clinical thing as a secondary endpoint, and now it's switching to a co-primary endpoint. You know that's worth five. You know there's 5% of POS wrapped up in that, you know, nobody can, yeah. nobody can do that for you. Um, I do think that that's one of the things that makes it particularly hard if you're comparing really broadly across assets in very different therapeutic areas, you know, cause really then you're comparing apples to, you know, uh, cars, right. Yeah, and yeah. you're not even, you're not even in the same category. Um, Whereas if you stay within a certain therapeutic answer like area, like oncology, for example, you can start to get a little bit more of a feel for uh, for those nuances and have a sense of which things might be you might consider more predictive than others. Um, but in general, I think the risk there is just to overvalue those positive signals uh, compared to if you hadn't generated them at all. Right. Like, would you, how much more valuable is it to have the, that piece of data um, versus not having had the piece of data again on this sort of secondary endpoint? Right. Um, Makes sense. And then on the patient population, again, there's a lot of, the, the, there are a lot of good reasons to change the patient population from phase one to phase, sorry, from phase two to phase three. And, um, and again, sometimes the phase two is designed to help inform that. Um, but there's always some risk involved. Uh, and particularly if there's uh, heterogeneity in the phase three, I think that's actually it, it's somewhat less common, but you know, related to your, um, to your lung cancer example, you, you do see some examples of studies that are done in a pretty narrow population of phase two, but then try to make a little bit of a land grab in phase three and open up the population into an area that really hasn't been studied before. Um, those changes can be can be very obvious, you know, biomarker driven, for example, you know, releasing the uh, the constraints in terms of biomarker, or they can be more subtle in terms of ages of patients, in terms of comorbidities, in terms of stage of disease, et cetera. Um, but I think it is important to rigorously look at the patient population in a phase three study and really think about uh, how different is it from phase two, how heterogeneous is it, and are there any reasons to be worried about the uh, the intrinsic scientific risk? Again, going back to the um, you know the the MOA, what's known about the biology, et cetera, in those uh, different subsets of the patient population that are going to be recruited. Um, so the one, one thing I always like to bring up here um, is that this is not, on the one hand, this is not nuclear physics, trying to, trying to capture the different uh, types of clinical development risk. Uh, on the other hand, it's really, really hard, and people have been doing this for much longer than I've been in the industry. Um, so, you know, certainly there is no key to unlock the castle, and if there were, we would just all be doing it. Um, that said, I do think that it's particularly instructive for people in the um, in biotech or earlier in their careers who maybe have not spent a lot of time within a big pharma R and D organization to get a sense of how big pharma companies think about these problems. Um, part of that reason is that, um, like these two papers, these are from AstraZeneca. Mene Pangalos uh, is the uh, executive VP of R&D there and is the co-author on both of these. Um, they, these two papers are two of the best in terms of really laying out in pretty exhaustive detail how AZ thinks about risk of early stage programs. Um, I think that's interesting, first of all, just because of how well articulated it is. And also because if you're at a biotech or you're an entrepreneur, um, part of your business model may be to partner with or sell your company or product to a company like AstraZeneca. So it probably behooves you to get inside their head a little bit and understand how they think about, um, how they think evaluating, about evaluating risk. You know, this is a not, this is an orthogonal way of thinking of things than what I just described, but I think there's a lot of parallels, right? The right target really is around that intrinsic risk. Um, right tissue is really around the early clinical, the preclinical and early clinical data uh, same with the right safety. Um, the right patients has to do a little bit with the intrinsic understanding of who are those patients. And it also has to do with trial design. Um, 
They've also focused on commercial potential. Again, I would argue that that's probably, you know, that's somewhat separate from our discussion today. And of course, the culture is a totally separate thing. So, you know, I think there are some interesting overlaps and the, these two papers also have some great case studies in them that are worth, uh, that are worth looking at. So, so if your goal is to partner with pharma or even now, you know, a lot of public market investors that see the cash that pharma has and kind of think, what are they trying to, going to buy? And if you, to understand what they really want to buy, you have to look at these sorts of factors to to know whether it's even a, an interesting asset at all. You can't just like, oh, this is a you know a hot indication or platform or whatever. It is the science there supporting the quality of the asset that would garner yeah. interest from a big pharma? Absolutely. I think just one other thing. Again, this is a little off topic, but relevant to that point that you just made. Um, I think it's important also to realize that in most companies. Um, a, a meaningful deal with an external party is only going to get made if that party's assets can really line up favorably with the internal assets. Because um, even though you might look and see, you know, you read the headlines and you see that Pfizer is swimming in cash, for example, um, that's certainly true. And there are those situ weird situations where a company has just so much cash to burn that they can do something, you know, very crazy. But more often what happens, and particularly on the licensing side, um, if you're going to in-license a particular or partner around a particular asset, if you're running the oncology therapeutic area or the neurology therapeutic area or whatever, you have to say what you're going to cut from your own portfolio because you're not getting more resources just to be able to do that deal. So that means that you're going to have to run at some level, you have to run that external asset through the same analytic process that you would be running your own portfolio through. Um, and that can be a, that can be a challenging set of criteria for external uh, for external companies and external assets uh, that have not necessarily done the science at the same level of rigor maybe that an AstraZeneca or a Pfizer would have done. Yeah, that's that's a really good point that you're bringing something into a, a big pharma company and something has to go out unless you know they can get some money out of thin air. So right. um, that's, a, yeah, that's a really good point. And yeah, pharma's had a lot of money for a long time and not every biotech has been bought up yet. So <laughs> there must well, be Well, right. I mean, I think that's the, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, cash, you know, thrown off cash uh, often gets used for share buybacks or other parts of the organization that have nothing to do with R&D. Um, so it's not like R&D all of a sudden gets a Christmas present and is allowed to just go on a shopping spree willy-nilly. Um, these things still have to meet some fundamental criteria. And again, these two papers provide at least one really well-articulated example of what that, uh, what those criteria look like. So that's it for this video. Uh, we have two other videos from the recording session with Frank, where we talk about a case study for how you analyze clinical trial data. And then another video after that that discusses where you can find data to uh, help you estimate the probability of success. So if you have any questions for me or Frank, please leave them in the comments. And again, check out Frank's books, which I'll also link below. Thanks.